Okay, uh, great. Thank you, Colin, and thank you, Denis, for the introduction. Um, and thank you all for joining us on this Zoom presentation. Uh, some of you I've presented to in the past, uh, and hello to those of you who I've met before. Um, those of you who I haven't, hello. Um, it's nice to meet you virtually. Uh, it's not quite the same, but it's, at least it's better than not meeting you. Um, so this presentation is about long bill curl use, in case you didn't realize. Uh, and some work we've been doing in British Columbia since 2017, as Colin mentioned. Now, long bill curl you, as you'll probably be able to tell by the end of this presentation, is probably my favorite bird in the world. And I've seen quite a few species in the world. And I think the reason I love it so much is this picture really encapsulates what's so great about curl use. It's such majestic looking birds. Um, and they're always in such beautiful habitats. I love the fields and the flowers that they live in. Some of the work we've done in the interior has been in, in, in the Kootenays, for example, has been fantastic seeing all the beautiful wildflowers coming up in the the curlews in the in wild prairie habitat has been fantastic. And these birds just really sort of capture the imagination. And I will talk a bit about this in, in this presentation. Um, but I've been very lucky in my role as a BC director. I've been here for seven years, as Colin mentioned. Uh, and I was lucky to get this job because it allows me quite a bit of flexibility in what I do. Um, I have to raise my own salary uh, through grants uh, and I have to raise the salary of quite a few of my colleagues as well. Um, but I also get to design and conduct my own studies, which is one of the most exciting things. Um, and the Longbow Curly is a really good example of that. Um, so in 2017, we started this project um, in the Kootenays, really getting uh, to grips with the migration of these species and, and um, their habits within that IBA, the Chuck Prairie IBA. And we've expanded that in 2019 uh, with work around Prince George, and we're continuing with it, hopefully this year, depending on whether or not uh, Bonnie allows us to go up there. Uh, but I think she will. So it's looking as if this work is gonna continue and I will talk a bit about that later on. So why would, would we study curl use? I mean, there's lots of birds out there um, and a lot of them are exciting, but why would we pick curl use out to study in particular? Well, they are quite unique in that they are the largest shorebird in North America by far. Um, I guess the bristle thigh curl you in Hawaii gets almost as big as this and then perhaps the uh, Wimbrels may get almost as large as this, uh, but they're really the females especially are um, enormous birds uh, and they have that really long beak as you all know. Um, the females have quite a bit longer beak than the males um, and it has the longest beak of any bird in Canada for its size and uh, interestingly they have interesting sex differences as I mentioned. Females have about 20 to 30 percent longer beak length than the males so with a bit of practice um, you can tell males from females. Uh, this but in the, in the photo here is the female, for example. Um, and they have a really cool uh, courtship display uh, with this really alluring sort of looping diving flight as they bound through the sky and they, they call in, in the air when they're, when they're displaying. And this is really what's captured the imagination of conservationists and, and naturalists um, throughout the Northern Hemisphere uh, for many, many years. Of course, the, the species um, curlew got its name from the British curlew, the, the Eurasian curlew. Um, which is a species that Denis mentioned before, actually, to me when we had a little conversation about curl use leading up to this presentation. Um, and really, that species is, uh, uh, is, is in a bit of trouble. Uh, and I will talk about conservation later on. But that species is not doing very well. Fortunately, the longbill curl you is, is doing fairly well in North America. Um, as I mentioned, they have this alluring um, namesake vocalization. So some people sort of um, alliterate the sound they've they produced to sound a bit like a, a curlew vocalization, curlew, curlew, something like that. Uh, I will play a vocalization now. So if you have your speakers up loud, you might want to turn it down a bit. Um, Hopefully you can hear the other grass and birds calling there as well as cows, of course. Um, so bonus points for whoever can identify the birds calling in the background there. Um, so it's that sort of farmland. Like that. Um, that sort of farmland sound, sort of, uh, you hear the cows in the background, you can hear the meadowlarks calling in the background. It sort of fits in well with the, 
the different species and, and, and animals that live in that environment. Uh, and that's really led to becoming sort of an iconic species of, of the Western grasslands. And people often relate to this. You talk to farmers, whether this is in the BC interior or on the prairies, um, and they'll wait every year for the curlews to return from migration. Uh, when they return from migration, they welcome them back, and then they, they live sort of um, in concert with these, these curlews that are breeding on their farms. Um, so there are very iconic species. Um, unfortunately, they have declined historically, and that's largely been because of hunting. There is an open season on this species, or there was open season for this um, within the US, not in Canada anymore. But within the US, it's currently illegal under the Migratory Bird Convention Act, but there are some, some hunters in the Western United States that do like to shoot them. Um, so that is becoming a bit of a problem. Uh, and they're currently declining because of anthropogenic factors, not only hunting, but land conversion. Uh, because a lot of their native grasslands, uh, we're no longer um, allowing grasslands to maintain themselves. We don't have bison anymore, which obviously maintained, it, maintained the grasslands, which the curlews benefited from. And they lived in concert with those uh, with those bison. However, now we farm too much of our um, our grasslands. Uh, as you know, the native prairies in Canada are declining precipitously, and any species like curlews uh, are declining along with that as well. They didn't traditionally breed in in farmland for a long time. However, they have started to do it. I think more because they have to than they they like to. Um, that was first documented in the, the late 90s uh, in in Alberta, I think. But um, they, they do live, uh, and I will talk about the range a bit later on, um, but they are currently declining because of anthropogenic factors, as I mentioned. So we, re we really want to know what those threats were facing the species. Um, yes, the Kosiewicz, Kas that's the Committee on the Endangered Species Wildlife in Canada. Sorry, I got the acronym wrong. But Kosiewicz has already assessed this species in the past and they've considered them to be at risk. Um, but we wanted to delve a bit more into trying to figure out what the threats were this species was facing with the ultimate goal of trying to guide conservation uh, that might be um, have a positive influence on populations of this species. And we want to do that throughout the annual cycles, not only on the breeding grounds in Canada, but also on the wintering grounds down in the US and Northern Mexico, because there's a lot of feeling, not only with curlews, but other species that the real threats are happening on the wintering grounds rather than the breeding grounds, because we have put quite a bit of conservation effort into protecting breeding habitat but not a lot of funding has gone into protecting wintering habitat for many species. Um, and that's certainly the case with curl use um, in Northern Mexico, for example. Um, so that's one of the things we wanted to figure out throughout the annual life cycle of the species where the threats really were. Um, and I wanna talk a bit more about hunting in the US. I mentioned that before. So some colleagues of mine in the US published a paper in um, conservation science and practice uh, last year, where they really got to um, write up a lot of their findings um, in Idaho, Montana, um, and New Mexico, for example, where there's quite a bit of hunting that goes on. Um, and they really documented this for the first time in a publication. Um, and there's a, a fellow there in the middle, Jay Carlisle, uh, and I'll, you'll get to see a photo of him later on. So I've worked quite closely with him um, from, from um, Boise State University um, in the work we've been doing in BC. So he's come to help quite a bit. So he was very uh, happy with his publication uh, really trying to get that word out about non-game uh, non hunting that's happening on the species. So a bit more about long bill curlews, um, Numenius americanus. Um, I mentioned in the intro uh, to this presentation that uh, they are such stately looking birds and that's definitely true. You can see how tall they stand on this beach this summer in California, I think. Um, and they stand really tall, they have beautiful big eyes and long beaks, the females have, as I mentioned, 20% longer beaks than the males. Um, and they have really nice sort of buff plumage um, and nice little marks on, on the neck. And then underneath the wings, as I'll show you a photo later on, they have beautiful um, sort of orange colors under the wings. If you get to see them do those display flights, um, it really stands out. Um, they lay about two to four eggs, depending on what breeding attempt it is. They start off at the beginning of the season uh, with four eggs in the nest. If that nest is unsuccessful, they'll try again with three eggs. And again, if that is unsuccessful, they'll try a third time with two eggs. Um, and then usually they give up after that. Um, three attempts is about all they can make. But that gives you an opportunity to determine what breeding attempt it is if you find a nest, whether it has two eggs, three eggs, or four eggs. It tells you if it's first, second, or third attempt. Um, and they nest on the ground, which is interesting. Most shorebirds do nest on the ground, of course. 
Um, a few of them are tree nesters, but most of them by far nest on the ground. Uh, they have a pretty long incubation period, so 30 days is a very long time period. If you look at most passerines, you know, they're only incubating for at most uh, two weeks, um, and that's to avoid uh, predation from their nests usually. McCullies really rely on um, sort of crypsis, so they hide their eggs really carefully in grass, and one of the reasons why they're patterned the way they are, of course, is to try and hide in grass, and sort of like a zebra can hide on the plains in Africa by having stripes while soaking the curlew by having um, those marks on the, on the neck really help with camouflage. So their incubation is done by both males and females, unlike pastorins, uh, where usually it's just the female who does the incubation, although males and females will both provision the young. Um, males and female curlews both incubate the eggs, which is really interesting. And that, that could also link in with their life history strategy uh, of having such a long incubation period. Um, we're exposing the nest to predation by nest predators for such a long time period. Um, they really need to be protected by an adult uh, at 24 hours a day. So the females will usually, not always, but usually do the incubation during the day. They switch to the males in the evening, usually between sort of four and 7 p.m. they'll do a switch. <clears throat> and the males will, will then take over incubation. And then they do uh, a switch in the morning as well. Excuse me. Uh, usually between five and, and seven in the morning, where uh, the males will come off the nest and the females will replace uh, for the day. That means the females have to feed during the night, of course, because they're not there. Uh, if they're incubating uh, during the day, they can't feed during the day. So they're usually up all night um, feeding. So moonlit nights are their favorite time of um, days because, sorry, their favorite nights because they can see very well. Um, they do really interesting, interesting things where in the evening when they come off the nest, males replace them on the nest often the females will gather they have these gathering grounds um, especially if there's a high density of nests often the females will all gather together before they just you know spread out to find feeding sites for the night um, and one of the reasons they incubate so long for 30 days is because that allows their young to be precocial so that's basically like a chicken so as soon as they hatch um, they can walk and so they can evade uh, predation from uh, you know, aerial predators or coyotes or whatever is trying to feed on them. Um, unlike songbirds that are naked and helpless in the nest uh, as a consequence of only um, being incubated for, as I mentioned, two weeks or so. But uh, <clears throat> so curlews live between sort of eight and 10 years, as far as we know. Uh, it's been difficult to tell because it's hard to catch the birds to ban them to then recover them to figure out how old they are. And there's not been that much effort, successful effort at least, catching birds in the past. So we don't really have a good record of band, um, of band recoveries. Catching in the first place is hard. Catching them again is almost impossible because they're pretty smart birds. So we don't know a whole lot about uh, how long they live. Um, so it's estimated between eight and 10 years. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm getting a really dry throat. Okay, so I was mentioning they have an eight to 10 uh, year lifespan. Interestingly, they tend to switch what they feed on depending on the breeding season or the wintering season. And that's largely because they spend the breeding season uh, in grasslands in North America, and then they spend the wintering season normally in, in wetter areas, either on the coast or um, in wet valleys. So they change their food from grasshoppers and beetles during the breeding season, more to worms and crustaceans during the winter period. And we were led to believe they bred in Southern US and Mexico before this study began. Um, and that turned out to be true, of course. So this is a classic map of uh, the distribution of the species between non-breeding migration and breeding grounds. And it shows that they breed in, in the Western US uh, and Canada. Um, and then they winter down in Mexico and coastal California in the Central Valley. And there's some interesting wintering grounds in, in the Georgia, South Carolina coast, as well as the, uh, the coast of uh, Alabama um, and Mississippi as well. Um, so it's interesting to see, if you look at the photo up here or the drawings here that Sibley drew in, in the field guide, they have that cinnamon underwing, which really stands out when they're, when they're flying. Um, and then you can see there's a difference between juveniles and adults. 
So this is picture here has this extremely long bill. It's definitely a female. And when I talk about in a second, next slide, I'll talk about different subspecies. Um, this subspecies, the parvus subspecies, which breeds down um, in this section here, they have much longer bill than the birds we get up in Canada. I think this picture is an illustration of the parvus subspecies. But those two subspecies are very poorly <clears throat> delineated. It's not very clear uh, difference between those two other than bill length and body size as well. So <clears throat> fortunately, Cornell has got fantastic data with eBird. You've probably seen these migration maps uh, for different species, but I, I got this one for long bill curlew, which is really interesting. So you can see the relative abundance uh, of long bill curlews during uh, different months of the year. And I'll play a video here that shows the progression of birds as they move from the wintering grounds, primarily the Central Valley of California, um, the Imperial Valley down here in uh, Southern California, Northwest Mexico, on the West Coast of Mexico here, and then on the, the coast of Texas, um, at the main wintering grounds. So the video is going to start here. So I'm going to pull, oh, hang on a second. I'm going to pause it where we are now, April. So you can see the birds have moved up uh, from their wintering grounds, really left a lot of those dense areas where they spent the winter. Although they seem to be hanging around in California a bit longer than the other sites. And they're moving up to several areas. This is that part of the subspecies I mentioned, moving up into um, in the central United States. And then there's birds that move up into Idaho and Montana, uh, sorry, not Montana, Idaho and Oregon and Washington, for example, as they move up towards BC here. And this is April, where we are now. Uh, and it's interesting, some colleagues and friends of mine who are up in Prince George, who've been working with for a few years now, um, have been looking for curlews as they do every year. Uh, and I've not, I've been following their emails and I haven't heard of any curlews being seen. Uh, yet, but they're, they're due pretty soon and they'll be arriving on the wintering grounds as the, slow, the snow melts, which is doing currently, uh, they tend to arrive because uh, it really opens up the ground and allows them to feed. So moving through again, June, July is when they're breeding. So the huge amount of birds breeding um, on the Canadian prairies here in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and then also down Montana and North Dakota. Um, this is a huge population here. Um, and it doesn't really shot very well, the Canadian population, especially the Kootenays, it's not even on this map. I think that's because our eBird records are not as robust, perhaps, as some of the other sites, which this data is primarily drawn from. Oops, I don't know why that ends so quickly. Try that again. I'll just let this animation play all the way through, because it's pretty cool to see them as they move up north, June, July, and then August, they move back south again down to the wintering grounds. And interest, interestingly, you saw they spent a lot of time during the September, October period here along Great Salt Lake. This is a fantastic wintering, uh, sorry, staging site as they move further south. There's another staging site somewhere here in um, New Mexico, no, it's Idaho, Utah, sorry. Um, so as they're moving south, they stage in certain sites where they, I think where the moisture levels stay pretty high in the dry deserts in the west um, during the fall period. So that's quite an interesting migration, thanks to um, Cornell uh, migration animation. Um, of course, I mentioned that they are of conservation concern, the species. So CASI, which is the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, there you go, um, designated a special concern, um, which means uh, provincially it's blue listed, which is also a special concern. However, CASI is reassessing this now. I think they're on 10 year cycles. So they put out a call for, um, people to write this report. So I put in with a colleague to write this report for Kosiewicz. Um, so hopefully we get that contract and we'll be able to assess it differently. Because I think that it's, it's listed too harshly. I don't think it deserves to be blue listed. I think they're doing much better than they used to. <clears throat> so the last Kosiewicz report estimated there were 23 and a half thousand of the species in Canada, <clears throat> of which 81% were in Alberta. 17% were in Saskatchewan, and only 2% were in British Columbia. I can guarantee you right now there's more than 500 in BC. That's a far uh, underestimation of how many there are. Um, so I think a full um, survey needs to be done of this species. A lot of this is based on the 
breeding bird survey that the Canadian Wildlife Service carry out, which is not a very appropriate survey to use because it's the wrong time of year. It's done in sort of June period, whereas you really have to survey the species in May when they're displaying to really capture the, the birds properly. Uh, we know the threats include habitat loss and conversion. So that's basically, as I mentioned before, we're losing a lot of the grass and it's been converted into to row crops, cash crops. <clears throat> a lot of, um, um, what's that yellow flower? A lot of, um, I'm confused. Uh, a lot of row crops have been grown and a lot of nat natural prairie is being um, torn up, unfortunately, which means that the birds don't do as well. Predation is a big problem for the species, especially from corvids. And corvids like crows and ravens are increasing everywhere, uh, which is obviously having a negative um, impact on grass and nesting birds, such as curlews. Uh, disturbance from ATVs is a big problem as well. Too many people, too many yahoos out there with ATVs um, tearing up um, good habitat for these curlews, which is one of the major threats to the species. <clears throat> and as I mentioned before, and as Jay found in one of his papers, uh, hunting, illegal hunting is a big threat in US wintering grounds. If you look at the um, a figure produced by the Breeding Bird Survey, as I mentioned before, it shows that the curlews are actually increasing, <clears throat> which makes me wonder why Cassiva would um, designate this species as special concern. So when we do, hopefully we do this reanalysis, uh, we'll definitely use data like this that shows that they're not actually decreasing us uh, at all, according to this, this graph here. So this is actually looking uh, at specific areas where you can limit the um, the way it draws data. So this is looking at bird conservation regions and this bird conservation region uh, is around Prince George. So obviously in this area it's increasing. Other areas in BC it's not increasing and other areas in Canada it definitely isn't increasing. So we'll have to look at each bird conservation region independently. Um, so that's not a bad story. But if you, if you saw the state of Canada's bird report from 2019 that came out, um, this was a very sobering uh, picture of what happened, what's happened to many bird species in Canada. And many conservation groups um, and scientists have been talking about this for years now. Really, it shows two interesting trends in, in shorebirds and grassland birds in particular. And whether you classify a uh, long bill curlew as a shorebird, which it seems to be in the winter, or a grassland bird, which it definitely is in the breeding season, um, either, either way, it's doing badly. Um, I have to see which group that species was. Uh, analyze it within, um, but it's definitely decreasing. Uh, the group that belongs to is definitely decreasing, along with aerial insect of all, of course, that's a really sad story. But it speaks to how we use how we uh, use our grasslands and how we cultivate crops. Of course, it's not all bad news. I, I'm not going to talk at length about how well waterfowl and birds of prey are doing. Uh, we all know the reason why waterfowl are doing well, because of great work uh, by Ducks Unlimited Canada. And birds of play, birds of prey, of course, by not spraying DDT as much as we used to or at all, uh, has resulted in a great increase in birds of prey. Most other birds are either not doing well at all um, or only slightly doing better. But this is a real wake up story, especially for birds like curlews and other grass and birds and shorebirds and owl insectivores. <clears throat> so the breeding bird survey that um, Bird Studies Canada, as we were at the time, now with birds can, of course, uh, that we did back in 2010 to 2012. Um, really um, continued a lot of the work that was done in the past um, and looking at just um, breeding uh, habitat for species across BC. And this, this map shows probable, possible, or confirmed breeding sites of curlew throughout BC. Uh, this map shows them uh, as a um, probability of occurrence rather than being breeding records. So this, this statistic is produced through not only the records of birds being cited, but also looking at other factors such as elevation, habitat type, and things like that. So there's, there's a biological and abiotic factors that are brought in to produce this through a general additive model process that produces this um, probability of occurrence. Essentially, it's how, how long it takes for you to find um, within 20 hours of searching, the likelihood of finding that bird. And you can see clearly that there are 
four main areas, which it's easy to tell now I've put all the, the roads in the, the cities on. So the Fraser Valley going up from, from Kamloops and uh, up towards Williams Lake and Prince George is definitely an area of uh, high use by curlews. There's a big population uh, in the trench around McBride. Um, I heard people were joining us from the Okanagan today, so we'll be glad to know. They probably do know that there are curlews um, within the valleys in the Okanagan, within the valleys. But of course, those valleys are as intense competition for water resources and for land resources for various uses. So that's a reason why that population is not doing that well. And of course, in the Kootenays out between Cranbrook and Invermere, um, there's quite a few species, uh, quite a few individuals breeding there as well. So what do we know about curly migration going into this project? Um, <clears throat> this is work that was done by some colleagues of mine in the US where they, they put tracking devices on curlews and they followed them down to their wintering grounds. So as the, as the map of distribution sort of showed, we know this is different subspecies, those species in the, in the West, the Numenius um, subspecies, and then the Parvis subspecies uh, in the Eastern portion of the range that migrates down to, to Mexico. Uh, and then there was some work done by the Smithsonian Institute uh, about four or five years ago where they tag birds on the wintering grounds, that population spends the winter down in Texas. So rather than catching birds on the breeding grounds and putting tags on, they're actually um, cannon netting them by, by broadcasting nets over the birds uh, and then catching a whole bunch and tagging them. So they followed those up to the breeding grounds in, in, in Canada, up in Western uh, Saskatchewan and Southeast Alberta. So that was really interesting to see that connection between wintering breeding ground rather than the opposite between breeding and wintering grounds. The whole purpose of this and the other work was trying to establish this idea of migratory connectivity but how closely connected are wintering, wintering populations to breeding populations? Do all birds that breed in the same area go to the same area to winter and vice versa? So how closely connected are wintering uh, and breeding populations? And of course, this tells you a lot about threats those birds uh, face. If connectivity is low, such that all birds breeding in one area of Canada, for example, spread out throughout the US, um, then the threats they're facing are distributed across a geographic area. So that's generally a good thing. If birds only migrate down to a small area and spend the winter all next to the same birds they bred next to, that's generally a bad idea. Because if, if a, a storm came along or pesticides were sprayed all over the wintering grounds and you're gonna hit a large portion of the population. So they're more susceptible to threats. Um, so establishing monetary connectivity really is a good way of, uh, of judging their conservation threats throughout the life cycle. So we knew something about the migration based on studies done in the past. And this is sort of putting it all into one figure. We knew birds from um, the Western US from migrating down to coastal California, Northwest Mexico, and a bit slightly central uh, Mexico. And then a few were coming down to the Texas coast or being tracked back into Canada. One bird they caught on the Georgia coast and actually showed that bird actually moved up and joined these birds up to breed up in Canada. And it's really interesting because that population that spends the winter down the coast in South Carolina and Georgia um, is declining a lot. Uh, and I think that might have been because traditionally, in the past at least, birds bred all the way across into southwest Manitoba. However, that population has been extirpated now, and that could have been the population that fed into these wintering grounds down uh, in Georgia and South Carolina. However, with that Manitoba population winking out, that could be why this population on coastal Georgia has now declined. There's only a few birds every year. So some interesting studies, they found quite a, a bit out about migration, but we didn't know anything about those birds were up in BC. We knew a lot of birds bred in BC in those sites that I mentioned before. We don't know exactly where they go. We thought maybe that some of the birds that bred there might breed even further south, and there's a leapfrog migration where they actually jump over those birds, not literally jump over them, but their migration is further south and their breeding grounds are further north. And they actually have a longer migration because these species we know does winter all the way down to coastal Central America as well, on the Pacific side. And so that was one hypothesis we had. We had another hypothesis that the birds just moved down to the, the west coast of California, because we know that birds also spend a lot of time on the, on the coast of northwest coast of California. And they didn't know, or we didn't know where those birds bred. Um, so that was a second hypothesis. A third hypothesis, they just linked back up these birds that breed in Oregon and Idaho in particular, 
uh, and then distribute their wintering grounds, much like the birds do from those sites. So those are the three hypotheses that we had. So we, we joined up with those um, folks from the US, especially Jay from Boise State University. And these are his hands, I mentioned him before. So he's putting what's known as a uh, platform terminal transmitter on the back of a bird. So it's a solar charging tag. Uh, it weighs 17 grams, a bit more with the harness material. Um, these curlews weigh between 700 and 800 grams each. So um, a 17, 18 gram backpack is a very small weight for these birds. You might think 18 grams is a lot. It would be on a chickadee, for example. It'd be heavier than a chickadee, actually. But on a curlew, it's not that bad. Um, and these are satellite tags. So it transmits to a satellite, a Doppler radar satellite that has a low orbit around the Earth. And so we get signals back from these transmitters. Um, every, we have a, a transmission uh, rate set of every two days, they transmit a pulse of, of signals that go out. Um, the reason why we don't have a transmitting every day is because the battery would die, even with the solar charging uh, panels on the back. So it's set for 24 hours on, 24 hours off cycle. So we get locations that vary in accuracy from at best case 200 meter accuracy to at worst case a couple of kilometers depending on the strength. But the reason what we get uh, pulse of signals within a 24 hour period is that we get at least we get one high quality signal within a few hours and so that tells us something definitive about where they are. We also put um, alphanumeric leg flags, this individual AX, uh, so that's a unique um, alphanumeric combination uh, and the color indicates where it was banded. So this is the bird that was banded in Idaho and there's this green. The ones that we use in BC, uh, they're white flags with black text on them. Uh, if I think it was, uh, no, that's right, white flags with tech, white flags with black text on them. Uh, and this is a, basically, it's a, it's a flat tag that goes over the bird's uh, leg like that, and we glue it together. So there's no glue on the bird's leg and it can spin around. Uh, it weighs next to nothing. Um, and yet, so even after the tag dies, or we hope to remove them this year, the satellite tags that is, um, the leg flags allow the general public um, bird watchers essentially um, to then recite these birds and report the sightings um, for as long as the bird is still flying. So that's really a positive thing to do. But in order to catch them and attach all these tracking devices on, you have to find their nests. So catching them is not like um, other species where you can, um, for example, woodpeckers, you plug the nest and then you, as they come out of the nest, you just catch them or set up a mist net, which is a traditional way that pastorins are caught. Um, or when you're trying to catch a raptor, you use um, a, dump, a lure, a pigeon or something, and they'll come down, they'll hit a net that you place. Um, long bill curlews, you really have to find a nest, uh, which is the challenging thing to do. You think nests are easy to find. It's not the case with curlews. Um, and this instant, this is uh, sort of mid to late May. Uh, and this is the area of natural prairie in, in the Kootenays that I mentioned, the Skookumchuck Prairie IBA. And this bird is sitting quite tight and it's during the day, so it's a female. Um, and the male will be off feeding somewhere. But you can, you can see the bird sitting on the nest, mainly because it's in the middle of the picture. So if we have time in this presentation, if you're still awake, that is, uh, we can play a little game called curly or cow pie, where um, I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures of a prairie habitat with a, a looks like a curly. You have to try and distinguish whether it's a curly or a cow pie, uh, because it's not that easy. Um, so this is what we did, essentially. So you have to find a longer curly nest. Once you find the nest and you know the bird is then tied to that nest, you want to find out well, are there eggs in it? How long have the eggs been in the nest? And that's important because you don't want to disturb the birds uh, right after they've laid the eggs because they're not as, uh, as tightly tied to that nest. They haven't invested that much time. And if you disturb them um, too much, then they'll just abandon the nest. So you want to wait until they've had that egg for at least two weeks. So they're halfway through the incubation period and they're less likely to abandon the nest if you um, unfortunately disturb them. So we'll, we'll observe them from a distance. Um, and then once they leave the nest to do that switch, that's when we take the opportunity to go uh, and, and have a look at the eggs. Um, and we do that because we can tell how long the eggs have been uh, in the nest, how long it's been since they were laid uh, based on the, uh, how they float. So I'll, I'll describe that in a second. So once we find a nest uh, and it's been there for at least two weeks, then what we have to do is, have, as a team of people, we have to take a mist net. We turn it um, from a horizontal net into sideways. And, sorry, 
uh, we turn it, whatever, we turn it over. Um, and then we slowly lower it over the bird that's sitting on the nest. And they just sort of sit there and look up at the net, the net as it's going to land on top of them. And they don't fend the flight. You've got, to, you've got to flush them up. And that's when they become tangled in the net. And you quickly uh, take them out of the net. Um, so this picture has Jay Carlisle in the middle there. That's Wendy Easton from Canadian Wildlife Service. And that's me on the left. Um, and this is in the, at, at Skookum Track Prairie. It's a fantastic place to, to do field work because you've got the Rocky Mountains behind you, uh, which in May are covered in snow, which is fantastic. And really interesting is these beautiful ponderosa pines, uh, which is unique because these curlews like to actually call from the top of the pines, which is something that Jay from Idaho has never seen before. And it's not, not usually something the birds are known to do. So once you lower it like that and you catch them, you quickly untangle them um, and uh, you don't use a mist net, you quickly put a hood over them. Um, so you a cloth or a neoprene hood and that's to calm them down essentially. It's like putting a bird in a bag, that's why you put them in the bag so they become very calm in the dark. Uh, just like that and it takes two people to hold them because they're very large birds um, and while you're doing that another person quickly has to float the eggs because the adult's not on the nest anymore so floating the eggs is quite exciting because you don't know exactly how old that nest is um, you can see from this image essentially we fill a tupperware container with water we put the egg in there and depending on whether it sits up vertically like that it lays horizontally does it sink completely or does it float up on, on the top uh, we can tell how old it is because as an egg develops, um, it gets more and more eggs, uh, sorry, more and more air inside the egg as it develops. Uh, and this allows us to tell how old it, it, is, it is. So we can't get an exact age, but we can tell at least within a few days. Um, and so if it's just a nest that we found, we don't know how long it's been since they were, were laid, uh, we have to do this in order to uh, know when we should come back and try and catch the owls. Once we catch them, of course, we have to measure them. Um, so this is, again, this is Jay here's hands, this is my hands here, and I'm holding this is the hood over the head of the bird to keep it calm. He's measuring the, the wing length there. Um, and so we also were taking uh, blood and feather samples from the birds, this is for genetic sampling, again, to try and resolve those subspecies um, delineations uh, by capturing birds throughout the bird's range and getting blood samples from them. Uh, feather, feather samples were largely done as an exploratory exam uh, exercise to try and um, have a look at the, uh, the isotope ratios within the feathers, tell us something about where the feathers were grown. Um, so that was all done for genetic and, and uh, isotope analysis. We also would weigh and measure the bird. Um, again, this is to try and add to the, um, the information on, on the species. Uh, we'd ban them on the right leg with a traditional uh, Canadian Wildlife Service um, unique uh, leg band. Uh, and we'd mark the bird, as I mentioned, with alpha leg flags um, on the opposite leg. So yeah, this is a bird here, as I mentioned, they're white, uh, white leg flags with, with black uh, letters on them, just AU. Uh, so as I was weighing it, put them on the back, they stick their legs up in the air, they're nice and calm. Um, so it's, it's quite a, a surreal experience really to have a bird like that in your hand. Uh, so we weigh them. We take a saliva sample, which is really interesting. And this is mainly, again, our colleagues in the US want to know this sort of information for, uh, various reasons. I don't think we've done anything with it, but I think they've, they've frozen those samples so they can have a look at pathogens the birds might have. So again, this is Jay Collar on the right. This is Graham Sorensen. I think you heard Graham give a presentation um, back in January or something like that, or February on the Coast of Waterbird Survey. Um, so he, he's uh, one of my uh, colleagues who works on the Mongol Curlew project. And then we put these PPT tags on the back of the birds. And if you look closely here, you probably can't see that actually says Bird Studies Canada on the back. That's what we were when we got the tags originally. Uh, so anybody who might find this tag lying around uh, in the middle of nowhere, they got shed by a bird at some point, a bird might've died, and its carcass just dissipated into the ground or something, uh, disintegrated into the ground. Um, or somebody might report it and find a dead bird and report that. And so it has that phone number on it, which is useful. As I mentioned, they're solar charging, which is good. Um, so the way we put these on, they're like wing loop harnesses. So it's like a backpack that we thread over the bird's back um, and has to sit on the bird's back like that. So when we, we put it on with a, a Teflon thread, uh, and when we do, um, we have to make sure the harness fits properly because if it's too loose and the bird's gonna get caught up in it or material's gonna ca get caught up in it and it could be very bad for the bird. If it's too tight, then that's also bad for the bird. It can lead to uh, wounds being created on the bird's back and feathers not growing back properly, which of course is not a good thing for, uh, for a bird. 
So what we do is we take an old tent, this is Jay's tent, um, and then we release the bird in the tent to see how well it can walk. So I'm gonna play this video here and you should be able to see the bird being released in the tent. Um, don't be concerned about it being harmed. It's a very soft tent and they generally wouldn't hurt themselves when this happens. So I'll play this video. So that bird had no trouble walking. So that's usually an indication, okay, we can release this bird. But many times they don't work that well because it's sort of limping on one side, which means it's an indication that you have to take the bird in your hand again and take the harness off, readjust it, put it back on, then test it again uh, in the tent. This results in the bird being in captivity for usually um, you know, anything from 40 minutes to 45 minutes, which is a long time to hold a bird, but you really have to be really careful before releasing them uh, because you don't want a bird with a half badly put on the harness. Expensive harness, I have to say, as well as the life of the bird, of course, is very important. Uh, but you don't want to release a bird that's got an improperly fit harness and then have that um, harm the bird throughout the rest of its life. Um, uh, by the way, those BTT tags cost about $5,000 each. Um, so we do want to kind of get them back. Uh, and I will talk a bit later on about recapturing these birds. So after we, we do that, um, we seal the, the cord, that Teflon cord I mentioned with super glue, um, not on the bird, but on to itself. Uh, so it's sealed on. And then we, once the bird has calmed down again, we'll release it. So this is a nice video of some some uh, cattle farmers around Prince George um, who had a curlew in 2019 breeding on their property. Um, and so this is uh, Karen and Dave Kellett uh, who live just south of Prince George in a place called Stoner. Um, and they had this curlew breeding on their habitat uh, on their farm. And we get our farmers to name the curlews that are breeding on their property, which really establishes a really close link between the birds that they've always loved for many years coming back onto their farms. But you know, to put a name on it uh, is, is, a, is a real privilege. And I think people really appreciate that. Uh, so this is Karen and Dave releasing uh, the bird on there. It's a little further down. Yep, that's good. You can hear the cow moving in the background. If she starts to get away, just let her go. But if you put her down, then... Okay. Oh, poop, poop, poop. You tell us. That's usually a, a screw you call they get when you, when you release them and then they usually shake their back because they've got a seven gram harness on their back and they want to get rid of it. Uh, but then they, they sell back and if they have a nest, which they do, uh, they'll go back to the nest within 10 minutes. So it really doesn't seem to have a great effect. Uh, Jay has done a, a pretty strong analysis on the hundred or so birds he's fitted um, these tags to in the past and shown them not to actually have a low breeding success on migration. Um, timing difference in birds that he didn't put curly uh, backpacks on. So that's all great, but uh, what kind of results did we get from the work we did? So we had to find nests, that was the first thing we did. So uh, in 2017, we were at Skook and Chuck Prairie, and you can see here there's a natural prairie on the left here. On the right, there's some irrigation from the Kootenai River here, irrigated fields, alfalfa fields. And this is a wood sorting facility right in the middle of the prairie. Interesting, this, this prairie actually is. Uh, um, it's, it's kind of, it's on its own. So it's between the, the Kootenai Mountains, the Purcell Mountains, and the various mountain ranges between it and the Okanagan. Um, but it, it has this microhabitat um, characteristic, which allows the prairie habitat to form. Traditionally, this would have been maintained by First Nations, um, and through bison, for example, that would have been there, or grazing elk, for example. Uh, however, this is solely being um, re- uh, vegetated uh, by uh, trees. Um, so that's one of the problems why this prairie is disappearing is because there's no fire anymore. It used to be natural fire cycles where every 15, 10 years or something like that, and that would make, that would keep those shrubs and, and trees from growing and that would maintain the prairie ecosystem. We don't like fires uh, as BC has unfortunately realized uh, quite recently, the fires are a bad thing. Um, so we suppress them too much, which means that prairie habitat is, is declining, uh, especially in this site here. So we found uh, five nests here. Uh, there were quite a few more there. Um, that population is about 10 to 15 pairs breeding there on this one prairie. We only found five nests, which for a first season was, was fairly good. Um, and we managed to catch um, uh, eight of those birds. Um, of which we managed to put transmitters on seven of them. 
And as I mentioned before, we allow naturalists and landowners to name the birds. So Mildred was a, a wonderful lady who used to collect a lot of data in that IBA um, a long time ago. And she had a fantastic record of the birds that uh, occurred on that, uh, that prairie. And that is being uh, re-entered into eBird. I think it already has been re-entered into eBird now to um, add that data to the, uh, the graded data set, which is fantastic. Um, so the four nests that we find, I have illustrated here, we found four sites. We banded males and females with different leg flag identifiers. Those are the alphanumeric leg flags I mentioned, the dates we banded them, and what the nest outcome was. So quite a good nest hatching um, uh, success of these birds. Um, so it seems like one nest uh, hatched all four of them, another nest hatched three, and then two and two in the other ones, mainly because they were quite quite late in the year. So their first uh, nests were unsuccessful, either for predators or because uh, usually it's predators that will uh, eat the nest, the eggs in the nest, and so they, they try again. So they're down to two, uh, two eggs and that plot in two hatching events. So that's what we found in 2017. Uh, unfortunately, two of those birds that we banded um, died within a few weeks of us um, putting uh, bands and backpacks on them, which was a bit concerning. Um, one of them, Kimberly, uh, was taken by a predator. Uh, we found the, uh, the bird and the backpack on the bird um, shortly after we had put it on. Um, and it looked like it had been eaten by either a Cooper's hawk or a great horned owl because they both had nests very close to where this bird was found. Um, Akina was another female, unfortunately, that was killed within a short period after we put the transmitter on. In this case, it wasn't a natural predator, it was found dead on the road. So we thought either it was killed through a collision with a, a vehicle of some sort, um, or it was dragged by a scavenger after being killed um, on, on the close to the nest, and then after it was dragged onto the, on the road that was driven over by a truck. I think the first is much more likely. Uh, but this transmitter was crushed much like the bird was, its beak was bent, so it's a pretty sad outcome for this individual. Um, so we lost two of those birds shortly after putting the transmitters on. We were able to um, create these hotspot maps, though, for two different individuals. This is a pair, Mildred and Sola, female on the left, male on the right, showing the map of the Scoot and Chuck Perry IBA outlined there. Um, and so the, the nesting site is that white spot in the middle. The circle around it is the 95% confidence interval of the bird's movements. So you can see the female has a much wider, um, so it's a 50% home range, not 95%, 50% home range estimation. Male's estimation was a lot smaller. You can see how much darker this is here. The color basically represents um, the density of location points. Um, so the male was, was sticking a lot closer to the nest than the female was, who tend to move a lot further. Um, and it's interesting that the females do the feeding at night, because obviously this bird was spreading out quite a bit wider at night. And what I think was happening um, was because on the right side of this, there were quite a few of those irrigated alfalfa fields, which we know the birds were using, because in the morning we'd go out and we'd find them leaving those fields to go back to switch with the males uh, to do the incubation. Um, so that could be a reflection uh, of what we're seeing here. So it's interesting to see difference between males and females. Admittedly, there's only one individual we, we looked at here. Um, we got some very good um, information on, on the migration of these individuals. So of the seven birds that we tagged, um, six of them went down to California, as you see here, the white, the red, um, the blue and the yellow individual here. Um, the green was Argyle, uh, which was one individual also from Scoop and Chuck Prairie. Um, and he wintered in a very different area. So you remember those maps that I showed before showing the Imperial Valley around Mexicali, south of the Salton Sea. Um, so he spent um, by far the majority of his year um, in that very small area and then moving back up through Idaho before getting back up to the Coonies. Whereas all the other individuals uh, sort of moved their way down through Eastern Oregon uh, and Nevada, Western Nevada before they got to. Central Valley of California, where they stayed for again the entire winter period. So again, showing that hotspot analysis for the wintering period. Again, this is Argyle that I mentioned down in the Imperial Valley. This is a heavily irrigated agricultural area between um, the deserts areas east 
uh, east of Mexicali and west of Mexicali. This is the US-California border here. And this bird primarily stayed in the US, moved down a little bit to Canada, to Mexico. But uh, you can see how it's, it's focusing most of its time in these, uh, these areas with the most amount of hot spot, uh, high density areas at least. And those tell us something about, we can look at the crops that were being produced because obviously the way that they're producing it is conducive to feeding uh, by at least one individual. And so these data um, are all being fed back to the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, who can then, I mean, they have a lot more data from the US, admittedly, we only have seven, seven individuals in 2017 tracked um, Jay's own project. Um, they, you know, they have dozens of birds tracked from, uh, from Idaho, but it all, it all contributes. Um, another individual was Mojo. He was a bird that bred again in Scumchow Prairie and he spread out quite a bit more. Uh, again, these hotspots uh, really concentrated in the Central Valley of California between Merced Santa Cruz and then one spot up here north of Sacramento. Uh, interestingly, these, this side up here is a, a rice fields. So rice agriculture seems to be quite popular with curlews. There's not a lot of natural prairie habitat left um, in this area because it's so heavily uh, cultivated. Um, but some plants, um, especially rice fields, if they're managed properly, um, especially with the amount of water that's um, and the timing of water inundation for rice cultivation uh, is, is quite popular uh, for curlew breeding habitat. So that's interesting to know. So I don't know if you saw on, on Argyle's map, but also Mojo, you can see they're spending you know, 220 days of the year down in the US and they only spend a third of their life back up um, in Canada and, as well as migration periods in between. So really these are American birds that spend only their breeding season up in Canada but spend the majority of their life down in the US. Uh, in 2019, we didn't go out in 2018. Um, in 2019, we uh, we started work up around Prince George, and I didn't really know what to expect when we first went up there. Um, I didn't know what the density of breeding birds was like up there, and I'd heard anecdotally from a few people that there were quite a few birds happening uh, breeding in this area known as the Wright Creek Road. This is uh, about 20 kilometers north of Prince George. Um, and we found amazing density of curlews breeding up there. Again, in agricultural land, not in natural prairies. It's not naturally a prairie habitat up there. It's all forest land that's been cleared for agriculture. Uh, but the density of birds breeding up there was astounding, um, especially uh, if you look at this, you know, it's 500 meters by 500 meters, this little box. Um, but there's one, two, three, four, five birds, five pairs of birds breeding within uh, this small box. Um, and that's, that's astounding density. And so we are going back up there uh, this year and I'll tell you a bit about that in a second. But uh, it was really great to work with the farmers up there as well. I showed you Karen and Dave Kellett's farm releasing that bird in the past. That was a little bit further south of Prince George, but they were great to work with as were the farmers around the Wright Creek area. Um, they're most, mostly hay farmers. There's a few cattle farmers up there as well. Um, both that um, land use seems to be conducive to curlew breeding um, of the birds that we had um, breeding there in 2019. About half were on pasture land and half were on um, hay fields. Um, but of course, the way that farmers um, cultivate those crops and also the amount of cattle they have on the land um, can have negative influences on, on curlews, especially with the fluctuating climate as we see seasons tend tend to get warmer, but they also tend to be um, very cold springs sometimes. Um, they get really hot very quickly. So that's gonna influence how the timing of uh, breeding for the curlews. It will also influence the timing of hay, uh, hay harvest, which if the timing of hay harvest coincides with when the chicks first come out of the nest, and that's gonna be bad news for curlews. I know that in Europe with the Eurasian curlew, that's been a, a big conservation concern there. Um, so that's part of one of the focuses of the work we're going to be doing out there is working with the farmers to try and figure out what awareness that they have of, um, of curlews on their farms. And most of them know very well curlews on their farms, which is great to hear. Um, however, uh, you know, when it comes down to not harming curlews, uh, often that can go unnoticed. And so we really want to get them plugged into stewardship activities that will benefit curlews. So we're going to start a curlew, uh, curlew friendly farm designation um, scheme up there so farmers can get um, recognized for their uh, awareness of curlews and the, the mitigation measures they're taking um, into account. Uh, so that's one of the plans. 
We also tracked birds in 2019. So this is showing a map of all birds we tagged between 17 and 2017 and 2019. Uh, it's a bit hard to see, and the colors don't make a lot of sense on this, but you can see the birds moving down here from Prince George and the birds moving down from the Kootenays in Southeast BC. And they're generally going down to, again, the Central Valley of California. And again, really interesting that there's one bird from Prince George that went down um, and spent some time where Argyle did down the Imperial Valley. And interestingly, that bird also went to that great Salt Lake um, site that I mentioned uh, in the introduction. Uh, and what's really neat is when this bird returned, this is only shown the migration south on the way it returned, it actually returned by um, migrating east of the Rockies and then crossing the Rockies um, around Banff and then um, dropping down to the Rocky Mountain Trench and getting back to Prince George that way. So very different migration pattern than uh, the other 20 or so birds we've tagged. Um, so really interesting that there's variation. It sort of also speaks to the variation going down to the Salton Sea area as well. Again, it's only about 10% of the birds go down there. An interesting split between, uh, between birds. We also did something really cool in 2017. We didn't do this in 2019, but we tried to follow uh, the chicks after they hatched. Um, largely because we had an employee who was hired to do this. We didn't have somebody in 2019 to do this. It's pretty labor intensive. Uh, you have to go out and, and walk around all day following these cute little chicks, which is not a bad job if you ask me. Um, so when they hatch, it's this classic shorebird cryptic plumage. They look very, very much like the habitat they're in. Um, and once they disappear, as they like to do, uh, you basically can't find them. You have to rely on the adults finding them and then you can get back in touch with the chicks. Um, and they don't tend to stick together. So the adults will try and corral them uh, to get them to stick together again. So they are quite difficult to follow. This is showing one freshly hatched chick in the nest of three uh, and then the nest of four eggs. And when they, when they tuck down in, in the grass, they really blend in well. And unless you're up close, you, you can't see them. It's, it's adaptive. You can see why they'd be like that. So you can see this one individual, one chick that was hiding there. I guess it's a photo that, that Kyla, the person who was working on this, did. So those four nests that I mentioned you before, um, Scoonshaw Prairie, um, this nest up here that birds uh, generally stuck to east of highway uh, 93, I think that is. Uh, and then they're bound on this side by the river, so they couldn't go very far. This nest here, uh, they roamed all the way down this purple nest here. Um, so quite a bit of variation in terms of the space that uh, chicks roamed over when they're, um, when they're fledging, when they hatch out of the nest. Um, so we learned a lot in this project between 17 uh, and 2020. Um, we learned that they're not really using agricultural um, fields to brood the young, at least in 2017, that wasn't the case where they had a choice between agricultural fields and natural prairie. Um, in those situations, the birds nearly always use the natural prairie to rear their young. You can see why, because uh, you can hide much more easily in the natural prairie where there's a diversity of plant species to hide among than you would do in a, um, you know, a cultivated landscape where it's just a monoculture and you'd stick out like a sore thumb. Um, so uh, where there's a choice, the adults tend to bring their young to, uh, to natural prairie. Where there isn't a choice, they will, of course, um, forage around um, in fields, which is what we found in 2020, uh, Prince George. Um, interestingly, we saw really uh, strong discrepancy between males and females in terms of the timing of their migration. We saw females leave uh, almost two weeks before males did. So um, after the chicks hatch, usually the adults will stick around together with the young for maybe three or four days. Um, and then the females get up and leave. And a lot of shorebirds do that, where the females are the first birds to migrate south. Uh, and the males uh, are, are, are straddled with the young to take care of them. Um, I guess they get some parental leave to do that. Um, and so they have to take care of the young. There's quite a few aerial predators, so they have to be able to protect them from um, coyotes, for example. Badgers are usually a bad, bad news for the species. Um, but the males migrate usually two weeks after the females, and then another two weeks or three weeks after that, the young will migrate. So they do that migration without any of the adult birds. That's why generally the, the young will gather uh, and fly in groups. Um, so you see these big groups of young curlews migrating. Um, later in the season than the owls will migrate. As I mentioned, the males will remain with the young for three to four weeks before, the, before leaving them to migrate on their own. 
Um, the Kelly has migrated over 1,600 kilometers from um, either the Central Valley or 1,800 kilometers down to the Imperial Valley. Um, at least this from Southeast BC. So it's quite a quite a large migration from these these individuals. Of the 14 birds we tagged, and this is KP individual that was quite well captured in this photo. Uh, unfortunately, as I mentioned before, two of them appear to have died um, in that, that winter, as well as the two birds that the young bird, that the females that died on the breeding grounds. So that's four birds that died within six months of being tagged, which is a pretty bad um, result. Um, in fact, the Canadian Wildlife Service was quite concerned after we reported these results to them. Um, because there's a lot of concern about the weight of the transmitters. Um, so it took quite a bit of convincing. Um, and that large analysis that Jay and his colleagues did with the 100 or so birds they've tagged down in the US to show the birds um, having the same return rate and survival, uh, survival rate as untagged birds to convince CWS that it wasn't because the tags were put on, it was just bad luck. Um, so those, those birds that we tagged in 17, um, the only one that we had still tagged, um, uh, died in the summer of 2019. Uh, as the seven birds we tagged in 2019, they're all still alive, which is the good news. Uh, as of September 2020, um, unfortunately, these these uh, terminal transmitter tags not only do they cost five thousand dollars each, but they also cost over hundred dollars a month per tag to track them. So you can't keep doing that forever; the money runs out. So after we we've been tracking these birds for a long time, we decided to turn the transmitters off. When you stop the transmission, that's the end. You can't turn it back on. So um, that's one reason we put the leg flags on so that we can recite these birds um, and then we can find out where they're breeding in order to catch them to take the transmitters off. Um, so that's one thing we're planning on doing uh, this year. Fortunately, we got a nice grant from the H from HGTF, the Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation, a stewardship grant uh, that's going to begin um, in April this year. Uh, we're going to return to Wright Creek uh, in May to capture, try and capture those seven birds. Um, of the seven birds, two still have the transmitters running. It's primarily because the Smithsonian Institute are paying for their, um, they bought the tags and they pay for the, the uh, satellite time. Nice gift from the Smithsonian Institute. Um, in return, we share data with them. We're actually putting out a, a strong paper fairly soon, looking at that big migratory, migratory connectivity idea that I mentioned before. So we're combining data sets from all across the species range, you know, hundreds of birds we've tagged to really uh, get an idea of where they're spending their time, what threats they're facing throughout their, probably get several papers out of this actually. Um, so again, that, that comes through the collaboration we've had with uh, my colleagues down in the US. We'll take the tags off. Uh, we'll, uh, of course, they'll, they repair every year. So they might uh, have untagged and unleg flagged birds as partners. And when you catch one, you should try and catch the other. So we'll put leg flags on whatever birds are nesting, including those partners of birds we're taking the tags off of. Uh, we'll sign up farmers and local naturalists uh, to gather additional data. We've developed a new application, an app um, for Nature Counts, which is the Birds Canada data portal. Um, so this is a special um, app you can use on a tablet or a phone, uh, sort of like eBird, uh, to collect data. Um, in, in more in-depth data than you can collect on, on eBird. Um, so we're going to sign up farmers and naturalists to start citizen science projects for them to gather additional data. As I mentioned before, we're going to start a curly friendly farm project where we um, recognize farms that are aware of and um, conducting um, mitigation measures to try and prevent harm to curl use. We will recognize them with a sign and we'll also create some best management practices which currently do not exist. Um, so it's advice to farmers on how they can um, how they can reduce their impact on curl use and other grassland birds too. We actually had requests from quite a few farmers, both around Prince George and and in the Kootenays, on what they can do to avoid harming birds. And um, I also want to bring you um, up to speed with World Curl You Day, which happens on April twenty first each year. If you haven't heard about it, um, it started um, in England with the Eurasian Curl You. Uh, we always do something special on World Curl You Day to recognize that, whether it's a um, a gift giveaway related to curl use, uh, or we, we also on social media platforms, we post stories about curl use as well. 
the reason that World Curly Day started really is to establish um, uh, awareness uh, for, for the plight for these culturally iconic birds, not only in Canada, but also of the nine species in this genus, the Numenius genus. Um, unfortunately, two of them are pres presumed extinct. So they haven't been seen in decades or even longer than that with Eskimo Curly, for example. Um, one of them is endangered. Um, two are near threatened and the others um, are not doing very well in general. Locally, they've declined, although as a species, they may not have declined. So as a, as a genus, they're quite threatened. And so to raise awareness to this, uh, the plight of this, uh, this genus, that's what World Curly Day is for. So April 21st in 21 days, I encourage you to keep your eyes open. We'll be posting plenty on the Birds Canada social media um, and also our latest news um, blog as well. So if you're a member of Birds Canada, you should hear about that. Um, what else? So I don't know how much time I have left, but I thought I'd talk a bit about some interesting sightings we had. What's the time right now? 8.44. Okay, so I've been talking for at least an hour and a half. So I don't know if you want me to go uh, any further into this. Um, Denis, can you? No, we still have time, Denis. I mean, we've got, you know, a good another 15, 20 minutes. Is it would that be good for you, David? Sure, yeah, I'll run through these videos quickly. It's quite interesting. So much like um, uh, Kildare do, um, Curlews also do a broken wind display. So we actually managed to get them on camera. So the bird very close to its nest that we found that started to do it sort of drooping wing. I thought it was sick when I first saw it. We didn't know the nest was there until afterwards. But that's a broken wing display of a Curlew. But Try to draw, oh, there we go, that fixes its wing back in the middle. Try to draw us away from the, the nest. Incidentally, it's to the left of the camera and it's really drawing us down the road away from the nest. It was interesting, we actually found a nest right on the side of the road here, which is unusual because it was in like this roadside stubble that was mowed by a, a, mower, a mower in the past. And, uh, pretty interesting to find a nest there which we wrote up for the um, Canadian Field Naturalist Journal as well. So then it left. That was an interesting find that we had. Uh, we also, uh, I got a video of a curlew copulation here. I don't know if you've ever seen curlews mating, but it's worth watching. Oh, hang on. Everyone wants to see this. Not a great video and I apologize. I had a small camera. So yeah, that's the male on the left and the female on the right. What the male does, he stops by stroking the back of the female. Um, you see, he's quite a bit smaller than the male. But again, the bill length, but also the body size is smaller. So he fluffs up the feather on her back to sort of stimulate her. That's a lot longer than most birds, I have to say. Okay. So that's a curly copulation. Um, now, if I don't know if you want to play this game, it's a funny little game. I'll run through these really quickly. So this is what the field looks like around Prince George. It's a, it's a hay field, it's, it's monoculture. Um, and uh, early in the season, when the birds breed, you can see there's no um, leaves on any of these uh, deciduous trees because they breed, you know, in, in early May and there has been no growth um, that far north in early May. Um, and you can see the bird just stands out like a sore thumb. It's really obvious. And uh, if we zoom right in there, that's the female there. So it's been quite easy to find those nests around Prince George. 
Um, however, in other fields that are um, not as quite as closely tended as that other nest, that other field, and this, this is a cattle pasture, um, so that's sort of a giveaway. Um, that's, a, that's a cow pie. And I, you can imagine in a natural ecosystem where you've got uh, curlews breeding around bison, um, that looking like a bison pie would be a good way to hide a nest or hide your, yourself from a predator. Um, so there's some um, thoughts in the US, at least I've published a small note on this, where they compare um, the distribution of cow pies in the landscape to the distribution of nests and look at how close the nests are to natural cow pies with the hypothesis that the birds are building their nests close to cow pies because that actually acts as a, um, a confusion, uh, a baffle basically against, uh, against predators. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we can, we can go into, we've got lots of examples here. That's another one. That's actually a bird. You can see it's, uh, it's beak there sitting on a nest. Um, and this time that's a cow pie, obviously. This is a really hard one. Can you even see what we're looking at here? It's right there. That's actually a curlew. So that's the same nest that I showed you before that was really obvious before. It's just later in the season when the grass has grown up before in that, uh, um, uh, in that uh, hay field. Uh, and once the, once the grass grows, it really, really hides the bird. And you can see the bird hiding here. You'd never see that if I hadn't drawn a box around that. Uh, which is really a, a, a fantastic reason um, for, for, for being so difficult to work up in some of these sites. Um, so I'll quickly thank people for, for allowing this study to happen, mostly funders and, and field help, a number of people have helped out in the past, um, and also for uh, farmers for allowing us to access their farms. There's some people I haven't included, unfortunately on this, I need to update this slide to include some of this around Prince, uh, Prince George. Uh, but it's been fantastic to work with farmers because they have a really interesting perspective um, on, on their curlews to visit their farm. Um, and as I mentioned before, they wait for those birds to return. Right now, um, the contacts we have around Prince George, I get almost daily emails from them saying, no curlews yet, no curlews yet. I'm just waiting for the uh, celebration when they do arrive. Um, so it's really been a lot of fun working with them. So thank you all for paying attention. It's been a long talk, but uh, I would love to take questions and whoever might have them.